Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. Will you stand with me, please? Father, we're here to meet with you and to adore you and sit at your feet. And we ask, Lord, that you'd manifest the spirit today. Fill us with your peace, your love, your grace, and your mercy. We desire to see you in all your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Oh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Oh, oh. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my God. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy, Lord. We thank you. We want to honor you, Lord. Honor you in every way, Lord, with our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. God will make a way where there seems to be no way He work in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day He works in ways he cannot 
not see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. Your heart in 
of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Hallelujah. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. Oh, you are my portion. You are my hiding place. Oh, I believe through every battle, and through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. Every promise to every breath I take, and I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love. Yes, Lord, I believe you are the way, the truth. The truth, the life, I believe you are. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that I knew. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today. With mercies that I knew, all my fears and doubts, they can all come to, because they can't stay long. When I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are. The truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I mean, we're saved by you. We don't, I didn't have to wake up in the morning and run through a gauntlet. I just prayed and said, thank you, Lord.
faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we pray. seated for a second, please. Bear with me. Uh, last night, it was a little warm when I went to bed, turned the fan on me and woke up and I was cold and lost my voice. But uh, we're going to prepare for communion and, and God had put something really on my heart. I'll kind of go quickly. Um, we're in the end times. I think most of us agree that. Understanding when the time is exactly, we don't know. But what's important is how do we continue in this time until the Lord comes? And as, as a reading and, and preparing for communion, God brought this scripture back to, to mind. I want to read from Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Because right now there is a spiritual battle going on in this world, in our lives, in the congregation, because the time is very short, and the devil knows it. And the one thing that will bring us together is Jesus. And so when I read Philippians, think about what he's saying here. Paul's speaking to a church. Um, there's some division. He doesn't tell us what the division is, but there's problems going on. You have people, you have problems, right? We do at home, every place. He begins this way, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation and love, if there's any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affliction and compassion, make my joy complete by being, notice, the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That purpose is really doing the Father's will, exalting Jesus Christ. That is the main thing. We're given two commandments, love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, strength, and second is love our neighbor. This is where the enemy is going to attack the worst, to bring a division. As it continues, he says, do this in verse 3, do nothing from selfish, empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. And he goes on, he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is our example. Now we follow him, but I think we need to follow him closer than we've ever followed him before as these days approach. We need to keep in focus what the main thing is, and is Jesus Christ. We, we come today as a, a body. We come to worship him. We come to sit at his feet, to adore him, to learn from him, to be edified, to be built up, to encourage one another in that love. See, that's what communion is really about. It's, it's a memorial 
Please remember it's a memorial. Nothing magical in that. But it's coming together and sharing in oneness, and that oneness is in Christ. We think about what he's done for us when we take the bread. It's a reminder that he gave himself completely, totally for you and me. God became man. God became flesh, dwelt among us. Tabernacle, the scripture says. He became our kinsman redeemer to bring us back to him. So when we take this bread, it's a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this bread, a reminder. We know there's nothing magical in it, but what's important is we think what you have done for us. And while we cannot save ourselves, and we'll talk about in the scripture today, we can live in such a way that we are example to others. Lord, that's our desire, that others will see us laying down our lives for you, for others. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take the bread. When we come to the cup, it reminds us again his blood is shed. See, today as we talk about our message in a few moments, it's about redemption. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ gave himself. And we are to do likewise to give our life first to him and then to others. Lord Jesus, thank you for the life that you lived, the sinless life, becoming man and dwelling among us, becoming that kinsman redeemer, and dying on the cross to save us from our sins, from ourselves, and to you. We thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take the cup. Why do you want to go ahead and do again one more? The song you just did. Yeah.
Father, we love you and we adore you and we ask this morning that you would fill us with your word, your spirit, that you'd pour your love out in this sanctuary today. God, that you teach us to walk the way that you walk, to be concerned about the things that you're concerned and that we would be like-minded like you, Jesus in every way that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. As I mentioned, spiritual warfare is going to increase. You're going to see it, as we, especially as we get into chapter 6. But Understand that this is a time that the enemy is going to try and distract you. He's going to try and create division, whether it be in your home, in your workplace, or whatever. The world is falling apart, no matter what anyone says. It's spiraling out of control. We're becoming, many of us, and I think all of us in some way, more selfish because we're hurt. And the one thing that we need to do is really steam Jesus, the place, and this is what we're going to see in the text, higher than anything else. And second, steam our brothers. Be patient. Love them. Love covers a multitude of sin. When we come to chapter 5, it's a critical chapter. It's a continuation, really, of chapter 4. They, they go together. We, we've talked about the church being raptured, caught up, and why these events are occurring in heaven, the tribulation, the, the timing has already began. It's called that 70th week prophecy talked about in Daniel chapter 9. The church is in heaven. And these are the events that we get this glimpse that John is showing us. Well, chapter Four focused it on, again, that worship in heaven. Worship of the, the creator. When we come to chapter 5, the focus changes from the creator to the redeemer, to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, at this point, again, as I mentioned, the church is in heaven. The church is the bride of Christ. We're caught up. Chapter 4, verse 1, we talked about that last week, the, the rapture of the church. And why it's a stumbling block for many people, the fact is the Bible records it time and time again. So John is describing these scenes in heaven. He's going to use this word from time to time, and you're going to have to follow it and understand it like. He's describing something the best he can in the words 
in the description that he can relate to in his own environment. So the theme is, again, this, this redemptive power of Christ, that he is almighty, omnipotent, and powerful. And he is our kinsman redeemer, coming from the book of Ruth. And this importance of this chapter cannot be stressed enough. If a person doesn't understand this chapter, everything else will be spiraling out of control and they'll read into things it's not about. So to understand, a right understanding, you need to understand that Jesus is the Lamb of God. This book, again, and I'm talking about the whole Bible, this is important to understand. You, you have, again, creation in chapter 1, and 2, you see it. But from chapter 3 through the end of the Bible, it's one real main theme, God redeeming sinful man. Man has fallen in the, again in chapter 3. But God has this, this red thread, in a sense, that goes through the whole Bible. It's the plan to redeem sinful man, to bring man back to himself, back to that place where he's without sin. He no longer has this sin nature because he was made in that image and likeness of God himself. Well, again, the, the subject, as I mentioned, is redemption. When, again, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, again, they forfeited the title deed to the earth. That's what we're going to focus on today. The title deed to the earth. See, Satan was that usurper. He is now the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Again, Paul calls him the god of this world. When, again, when Jesus in Luke chapter 4, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led in the wilderness by the Spirit, he was tested. And he takes Jesus up to a high mountain, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world if you'll just bow down and worship me. See, he had that world. The world was in his hands. God, sovereign control, but he's now going to redeem this earth back. Satan has had a hand in the life of this world and your life and my life. And we will allow him or we will say, no, I'm not going to allow you in my life. And this is what this is all about is, is redeeming. Because Jesus did not say, no, you're not the God of this world, I am. Satan wanted him to do it his way, not God's way. 1 John 5, 19 says this, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Limited what he can do to you, but this whole world lies under his power. Satan is going to move like ever before, trying to stir up to, dissension between this world, between governments. You know the story as we go through, you'll see it. The battle of Armageddon. And the battle is not in Armageddon so much as, as the blood runs up to the bridle of a horse. Again, John sees a, a scroll. And this is what we're going to look at, the, that title deed of the earth. It was a a commitment, giving it to man originally, as I mentioned, the authority, the responsibility of, of this planet. But when he forfeited it with his sin, Satan took it. Romans, though, 8, 22 and 23 says this, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Not only this, but also ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption of the sons and the redemption of the body. 
All creation groans because what happened in the garden, by the way, don't think that you wouldn't have done what Adam did or Eve did because Adam and Eve were God's best at that time. They were without a sin nature. And you and I have a sin nature. Even though we've been born again, we have this struggle until the day the Lord takes us home. Now, let me read another passage, and it's Luke, and this is just kind of setting up the text. Luke 21, verse 25 through 28 should go on the screen. There will be many signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and upon the earth dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world and the power of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because the redemption is drawing near. Now this passage in Luke, there's also a parallel in, in the book of Matthew. This is the tribulation. These that are going through the tribulation are going to see these things. Next week when we start chapter 6, we're going to be talking about these things and how they line up. When you see these things happening, know your redemption draws near. That's not for you and me. Because we're in heaven. We will be taken out, and we have been taken out according to chapter 4, that rapture right after that church age, right before that tribulation. There's a moment in time coming, again, I don't want to fix time. No one knows. But the church, we talked about as a dispensation, that church age, We'll be caught up. We use a, that phrase in the Bible. We'll see it again and again as we go through Revelation. After these things, metatata means a chronological order. After that church age, then the church is caught up. And we're going to see that flow as it's laid out in a chronological method. These things that we're going to see that are happening, I thank God that we're not here during that time, but also... Our hearts should grieve as we get there because it is so horrid. We should not want anyone to go through it. But because God is just, He's holy. He must deal with sin. Now, Christ, though, is that Redeemer, the perfect Redeemer. Look with me. As we begin our text now in verse 1, the scroll of redemption is what we're going to look at. I, I saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne a book written inside and on the back and sealed up with seven seals. We know at that time they didn't have books. It's a translating thing that people would understand because most people don't understand a scroll. We're going to see what this scroll is. We're going to look at some verses of the past. But what I want to call your attention, I saw in the right hand of him who sat upon the throne, God the Father. The right hand is the right hand of a blessing. This is to be a blessing. All these curses, they may not seem like a blessing. They are because they focus on the redemption of all creation, this earth and man. And those who go through the tribulation... Do not choose life, they choose death. They do not choose communion and unity. They choose just the opposite, separation. Now, it's true, the church, ecclesia, means called out. We are the called out ones, called out of this world, called unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and at some point we will be caught up. We're pilgrims in this world. This world, remember, is not our home. The best is truly yet to come. Let me read from Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. 
And really to understand the book of Revelation, Daniel 7 through 12 are some of the most powerful verses in helping you understand and put things together as we go through. It says this, as for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. What it's suggesting here is what is in this scroll, in this book, as it describes, are some of the things that have been revealed to Daniel already. Let me read and show you some more. Ezekiel 2, verse 9 and 12. Excuse me, 9 through 10. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a, a scroll was in it. And when he spread it out before me, it was written up on the front and the back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. This is talking about the scroll that we're going to open here. See, the book mentioned here really is a scroll, as I mentioned, because they didn't have books in those days. The scroll was sealed. It's sealed with seven seals. There's, there's a lot of different thoughts on how this is sealed. Some say as the scroll came up, there was a seal, and somehow it comes all the way through, and they would open them only a certain area up at a time. But probably most common, it was rolled up as a scroll and simply seven seals on there. And these are the terms for the earth to be redeemed, for God to, to take it back, redeem this world. These terms have to be met. That's what we're going to see today. It was a legal document that they know in archaeology. They found exactly what I described. Scrolls rolled up with these seven uh, uh, markings. They were done in wax, sometimes in, in clay, and then they hardened. And they found them, and they were title deeds to, again, land. Now, when you talk about redemption, please understand, the things that would be redeemed, for the most part, were slaves, and then a wife could be, again, redeemed and a land. By the way, you were slaves to sin before you became a believer. And when we look at what Jesus Christ has done for us, we have been redeemed. And we, at some point, when we're caught up in, we'll experience the full redemption not just of, of our spirit, but the body fashioned for all eternity. We are, as the wife could be redeemed, we are the bride of Christ, caught up to be with him. The land it speaks about to Israel, a special message, a land that was promised to them, to Abraham, they will receive, but we will rule and reign. And we will share in all these things because we've been grafting. The, the symbolism is, is very strong as you go through this book. And I'm not going to go way off in the symbolism, but just cut to the kind of the chase, what we need to understand. The seven judgments were the terms, as I mentioned. And we're going to see them, each one of those terms leading into another term, the seven seals, We'll come across one, two, three, and we'll look at six of them next week. And when the seventh one opens, it opens then to the trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet judgment opens to the bold judgments. And every one of these events is, is, is part of this redemption taking. But in this, there is a merciful, compassionate God still calling out, reaching out to man, still revealing himself, and the bulk will not repent. In fact, when we see in chapter 6, hide us from him. They know who he is. This is a literal unveiling of God's purposes here for the world. The final steps of history of this place. No matter what anyone thinks, it's not going to go on and on and on as it is. God brings it to an end. Revelation chapter 10, verse 9 through 10 says this. So I went to the angel telling him to give me a little book. 
And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter. But in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in the mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I ate, ate it, my stomach became bitter. See, what this angel, again, it has this little thing and, and he's, he's going to eat this little scroll. It's sweet knowing the redemption to see all these things that were going to happen, all of it coming together. See, man, no longer in this, this sinful state, no longer sinning. As we described heaven last week, the things that were they're missing in heaven were pain and sorrow and death. And the list goes on. So he, he tastes these things, he sees these things, and he's excited. But then he sees the judgments, the horror. You ever been in a place where you're seeing things you don't want to see? Last night, Judy and I were watching something together, and there's one of those scenes that comes up, and um, somebody slices their wrist. And I kind of get my legs, I kind of feel, ooh, 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 and, I, and it's just, I don't like blood. And I thought about this passage, how horrible this is going to be. We don't want to see anyone go through the tribulation. And God desires all to come to repentance. When Jesus Christ died, he died upon the cross for every person in this world, not just elect few, but for every person. And this should grasp our souls. This is the point that God wants to bring us to, that we have his heart. We're concerned about those things. This world is going to hell. And we need to pray like we've never prayed before. We need to keep the focus on what is really important. The end is coming. It doesn't take much to figure it out. Look at the anger and the hatred on the news. The wars. You can't even line these up with scripture because these, these are nothing. Oh, I know they're leading. Everything's leading. But what's important is today. It's important today because how you live today will affect tomorrow, your friends, your family. It shows what's important to you. We know what's important when we look at the scripture, but is that what is important to you? Is that the main thing in your life or is it something else? If you were to close your eyes in this world and you would be buried, what would people say about you? What, what, what's the most important thing? Oh, he was a good worker. He played sports good, nothing against sports. Or would it say he loved God and he loved others? He so cared about people. Because when I say that, that's Jesus Christ. He gave his life for you and me. Look with me in verse 2 of our text. That we see the search here. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break the seals? And no one in heaven and on earth and under the earth were able to open the book and look into it. Don't worry about this strong angel. Maybe it's Gabriel. Maybe it's Michael. We have no idea who it is. I've heard people say, well, how strong is he? That's not the point. The, the point is, there was no one in heaven, John's seen this, no one in heaven that's worthy to open this scroll, to break the seals, to, to redeem this earth, to take it back. This, this is grief. This is sorrow. This is painful. This is, this is horrid. And in heaven, in this moment, there's this silence, this sadness. No man can save you. You cannot save yourself. 
No government can save you. I'm proud to, to be in America. But your government cannot save you. No amount of money can save you. Only Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ became that kinsman redeemer. He became a man so he could come alongside. It had to be the, the closest family relation to redeem you, to redeem me, mankind, back. See, there's no one morally worthy to open that scroll. No one who is just, holy. Who qualifies to, to break the seals, to lay claim to this earth? No one. See, these, this is the terms we're going to look at. And, and they already know there's no one here. And no rightful heir they're looking at here. Who is worthy? Neither man nor angel stirred. None. None at all. Not Michael, the guardian angel. He couldn't. Not Gabriel, the evangelist that we... We see in the Bible, this strong, those are strong angels. They couldn't. None of the, the angels, the myriads and myriads of, of angels. None of them. No one. No one but Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer. And this is the story. Only Jesus could do this. Look with me for a second at Mark 8.33 on the screen. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Could this apply to anyone here? I think it applies to every one of us because there have been times in our lives when it's about me. I'm more concerned with my own will than God's will. I, I lived a life like that for 40 some years. This is why we're so unworthy. He's not saying he's really a child of Satan, but we're acting like it. We need to examine our actions or attitudes daily. I do. Unwittingly, Peter was speaking for Satan, being used by Satan. And we're going to see more of this as time goes on. I've, I've learned that hurting people hurt others. Hurting people don't, all they can focus sometimes is on their pain. Sometimes it's the pain, a death of a, a loved one. Sometimes it's physical pain. They lash out, and sometimes they don't even realize there's something else going on in that show I was watching last night. It was interesting. They had this boss. It was a detective show, and he was the head of the, the office there and head detective. He was a terrible head. He ends up getting shot at the end of the, the show here. And what was interesting is they found out afterwards after they talked to the wife because he had just, he was kind of new on the job, been there for a year. And they knew he didn't care about what had went on. And when they were talking to the wife afterwards and she says, you know, this war, because it was during a time of war, she had lost two sons. She was numb. She had no feeling. There was nothing left in their marriage at all. And he died that day that his kids died. And the one detective that was working under him, all he could do was complain. And he says, I didn't even think to ask why he was doing what he was doing. This world... It's coming to a point where it really cares about no one else but themselves. Please don't fall into that rut. 
Please, because then we'll be like the rest of the world. Again, that's why I read Philippians, be other-centered, thinking about others, thinking about Christ and what Christ would have us do. What continues in verse 4, the sobbing seer or prophet, then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book to look into. See, this, this grief, tears were just, it, it, it's picturing this person, tears are just gushing out of them. You remember Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem and he sees Jerusalem. He wept or sobbed just like this. How I wanted to gather you like a mother hen gathers the chicks, but you wouldn't let me. This is the heart we should have, like Jesus. John knew that, that finding the Redeemer and opening the scroll was necessary. Otherwise, this world will just go on and on and on and on, and sin will become worse, and evil will become even more evil. More evil than even in Genesis chapter 6 when they continually thought on evil all the time. This is why it's so important to look to the Redeemer. Praying for his will and being available that he could use you and me. It's a time in all of our lives that we not just weep, we sob. Jeremiah also wept over Jerusalem. When did you ever weep over the spiritual darkness in this world? We can find ourselves complaining about the world. We can find ourselves complaining about everything. But are we weeping and grieving and praying and, and calling out to God? God uses prayers, but will we pray? Will we grieve? Jesus did. And I believe he's grieving now. And I believe he even grieved over Judas, knowing what he's going to do. But remember, Jesus wishes none to perish, but all come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. John wept audibly, not because of any weakness, but because of his deep, concern for what was next. Someone once said, without tears, the revelation was not written, neither without tears can it be understood. Oftentimes we're excited, wanting to know the details, like seeing an accident. You'll see a rope and people rope wanting to see and everything, and that's not what this book's about. Hell like is going to break loose like you have never, ever imagined. What we're going through now is nothing what this world will go through. And it should grieve our hearts, move us to prayer. It should unite us, not divide us. It goes on in verse 5. And we see the slain lamb. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is in the tribe of Judah. First, we see this again, the, the lion. He's the one that's going to bring the redemption. It's the lamb that was slain. It's the one who's done the work. Excuse me. See, John was encouraged until he encouraged, excuse me, John was encouraged <coughs> and put his eyes back upon Jesus. I love looking in the book of Samuel just for a second and not reading it there, but just reminding of his story of David. David was discouraged. What did David do when he's discouraged? Encouraged himself in the Lord. And there are times that we need to stop Get off this rat race for a moment and, and just encourage ourselves and look at Jesus. Where are we going? What are we doing? 
Genesis 3.15 says this, and I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is the first prophecy of Jesus Christ, the one who would be that kinsman redeemer, the promise and the hope that God was not going to leave this world in this way. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, and when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. And that's speaking about Jesus Christ. He's come. But the question is, do you know him? A lot of people are serving him and talking about him, but, but do you know him? You know, in Matthew 7, and he lists several things, but go away, I never knew you. You have friends. Open the Bible with them, talk with them. Pray for them, make sure that they understand who Jesus Christ is, what he's done, what's going to happen next. Leave the newspaper for a moment and open the Bible and, 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 and let God speak to us and speak to others. When we look at the, the news after a while, it's depressing. Encourage yourself in him and teach others how to encourage himself because that's one of the things that the enemy will do. He will try to depress you. He will try to distract you. And like never before, which we always should have, is lock our eyes upon the author and the finisher of our faith. Christ is described, though, as the, the lion, the tribe of Judah. It, it takes us back to Genesis 49. I've talked about that off and on, where, again, uh, Jacob is laying his hands upon blessing, again, his sons. And there's this mention again the Messiah coming, the blessing that would come through him. David, again, was promised that, that God would raise up one after him in his dynasty. All these things are, are pointing again to the lion. See, the lamb and the lion are one. Different aspects. Jesus comes back at his first coming as a lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But when he comes back, he will come back in judgment. But he always gives a warning before wrath. And the wrath is about to come. There he stood in the courts of heaven, ready to fulfill the remaining fulfilled prophecies pertaining to the earth. The, the kinsman redeemer who held the, the crown, the rights to rule, the sovereignty. And he's still sovereign God, but he is allowing things to happen. Faith is not tried. How can you know it's real? Your faith is going to be tested like never before in these days. Are you ready? Are you rooted? Are you grounded in him? And see, that's what's important is knowing who he is. Knowing he'll sustain you. He'll keep you. He's the one that's there holding you up through each circumstance. The sobbing seers consoled by one of the elders who assured him that the one who presents, again, it can open this scroll. See, the root of David is overcome, is to open the scroll. The seven seals, so the root of David, taking it back in all the genealogies, whether it be Luke or Matthew, you follow them, it all goes back, all the way to Abraham, all the way to David. He's the one. He's the kinsman redeemer. See, he is the, the root of David, the, the promised one that was in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9, and again in, in Psalm 110, verse 1. David, the greater than of David. He's the origin, the creator of David. Born in the city of David, Bethlehem. Listen as I read Luke 1, verses 32 and 33, and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him a throne of his father David, 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen right there would be good. Because you and I will be reigning and ruling with him that we'll see. This is what we're looking for. He's the only one that qualifies to open the, the seals, to claim the title deed to the earth. Let me read again, Revelation 17, 14. These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called and chosen. And catch that last word, faithful. Don't you like that? He is the one that will make you faithful if you submit to him. You cannot do it on your own power. You need him. Apart from him, you can do nothing of any value. Now, I'm going to read from Revelation, again, chapter 5, verse 6, though I'm going to read in the King James just for a moment. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood the Lamb has been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent forth into the earth. See, John sees this, again, this lamb, this lion. But instead, he saw him as the lamb. You know what he saw and what he saw? And we're going to see it in a second. The handprints, the scars. That will be with Jesus all eternity. You will have a constant reminder of that every time you see him. See, the first thing demanding attention is is really the lamb. He's in the center. And this whole book is about him. Do you remember that? It is about him. Remember I gave that illustration when we first started the book of Revelation? There was a a, a little boy and his father come home and wanted to play. And the father says, oh, well, let me read my book here. It was a Christian book, and, and the boy says, no, 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 no. He says, okay. He takes a page, and he tears it apart, and he says, puts it down. When you put it all back together like a puzzle, then we'll go. In a matter of moments, the kid puts it together because what he saw was a picture of Jesus on the back. You have to look at this book and look at it. It centers around Jesus and nothing else. And sometimes people go off and they drift into all these other things and they're missing really the heart of a Savior because God is revealing his nature, his character, and who he is. And I asked that question earlier. Do you know him? Because as you go through this book and if you keep focused on you will know him in a way that you've never known him. And when you look at other people, you will look at them differently. This is very important. See, there was no mistaking the identity of that lamb. He still bears, again, as I mentioned, the wounds in his body. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world that you find in the gospel of John. He's the only one acceptable sacrifice for man's redemption. The lamb, though, as we talk about symbolism, the lamb is what? He's meek. He was the sacrifice. Meekness is a wonderful quality. If you're going to be like Jesus, you need to have this meekness. You need to live a sacrificial life. Romans chapter 12 talks about that in the very beginning. If you're living for Christ, this is how you will live. This this is how we're ready for these next events are coming coming to happen. Not chapter 6, but those days that lead up to chapter 6, whatever that may be. Remember, John was an eyewitness of Jesus. He was there when Jesus died upon the cross. He was there with his mother. He he knew him. He he saw him. He saw him resurrected. He saw the scars, the wounds. He goes from sobbing to joyful excitement when we get to heaven. You will recognize him. Well, wait a second. I've seen so many different pictures of Jesus. What is he... What does he really look like? When you get to heaven, there's going to be no question who he is. You will know him, and he will stand out, and all heaven surrounds him. He is the center of everything. See, after these sealed judgments are poured out, as I I mentioned upon the earth, Christ comes back, and he'll be again with the redeemed ones. That's us. We come back at the very end. Zechariah 13, verse 6 says this, And 
one will say to him, what are these wounds in your arms? And then he will say, those with me which I, I was wounded in the house of my friends. This is when Israel will recognize for the first time he is their Messiah. You know, when, when they build the temple in Israel, the ones that are pushing for that are the ultra-Orthodox, and they will exalt the Antichrist and not even recognize it. But they will. They'll be broken. And his mercy is sufficient if they will confess their sins. Zechariah reminds us Israel will finally worship the Lord. While there are many messianics in, in Israel, there are true messianics following Jesus Christ. Numbers are somewhere between 20 and 30,000 last I heard. Small number. But that is a large number because it's continuing to grow. All these symbols, the lion, the lamb, they seem to be incompatible. No, they don't conflict. They complement. The two sides, again, the, his first coming, his second coming. He's, he's gentle and meek, and he's the sacrificial lamb. But when he comes back, he will be ruling, and he's reigning, and he will judge. And all judgment has been entrusted to him. He is the lamb, and he has the right to make the claim. He's the kinsman redeemer, as I mentioned so many times. But when the lion comes back, he is clothed with majesty and power, and he will overcome them all. Again, the rejected one is about to come forth in all might and all power. When Christ ascended after that resurrection, he sat down. But notice he's standing. Picture for you and me as we go through this book, he's standing, he's ready. He's ready to come back. Ready to not only come and get us, but there's a point he's going to say enough is enough and this world must be judged. He will judge this Christ-rejecting world. When John saw him, notice again in verse 6, there were seven horns and seven eyes and the seven spirits sent forth to earth. Uh, the horns always speak about power. When you go through the book of Revelation, you'll see that. You're reading the Old Testament. You see that symbolism. It speaks of power. It speaks of leaders. The eyes speak of seeing, omniscience, all-knowing. See, John saw him as he had all-powerful is what it's saying in, in symbolism, Middle Eastern way of talking and thinking. He's all-knowing. We know that. The seven spirits of God, this becomes an argument for a lot of people, and I don't want to argue, but the seven spirits, seven meaning complete. Totality, he is full of power, he's full of knowledge, and he has all wisdom. The spirit is the one that gives the wisdom. So he, he again stands for authority, imperial power, he's complete in every way. And something's about to happen this judgment, Matthew 28, 18 says this, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. He is the sovereign one. You know there's been authority given to you? Yeah, authority's been given. What will you do with that authority? Authority is a husband at home. Are you going to be the godly man and wash your wife with the water of the word? You're going to lead your children to Christ, at least bring them up in that. In your workplace, he's giving you authority. I don't mean to, to, to be towering over your boss, no, but authority to speak his word. See, when you speak his word, you speak authority. You don't have to say, thus says the Lord, because the power is in the word, and the spirit takes that word, and he will work. Christ now steps for to exercise that, what we're going to see, perfectly equipped to deal with whatever opposition would come, and he knows them all. His seven eyes stand for his perception, his seeing. Christ possessed the, this essential abilities needed. Again, power, perception, omnipotence, 
omniscient, knowing all things? Which of the seven spirits of God sent forth all the earth? All this goes for everything Jesus is, the spirit is. The spirit during the, the tribulation will go forth. Bringing the gospel along with 144,000. We'll see when we get there. Verse 7 goes on. And he came and, and took the book, the right hand of him who sat upon it. He, he took it out of that right hand. See, the Messiah's normal position present was at the right hand of God. He, he would go and he would pick it up. He's, he's ready to exercise authority. He's ready today. When that moment comes, when the Father says, now is the time, he will come. And he will exercise that full authority and full knowledge. It's in verse 5 through the end of this chapter. We're going to see some focus. But there are three groups that are worshiping. They're worshiping because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but he's also the lion going to come back and deal with all these things. And he is the one, only one that can open the title deed of the earth. All tears have stopped. All eyes are upon him. Everyone is aware. Everyone sees. So we're going to look at first the singers in verse 8, beginning there. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before him each one holding a harp and the golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the, the saints. See, the believers' prayers, I love this. They're, they're in this bowl. It's a, it's a golden bowl. Some of them say, well, this golden bowl represents the, the importance of these. Notice the golden bowl full of incense. I remember when I was a young whippersnapper and I had incense in my little place I lived and I liked the smell of it. Now I don't like it anymore. But incense were fragrant offering, you know, in the temple, in the tabernacle. In your prayers, God inclines his ear to hear, but they're a fragrant offering to the Lord. This is what it's talking about. They're important. They're fragrant. They're pleasing. We need to spend time in prayer. See, that's what they really are. They're prayer of the saints. Now, any saints here today? If you're a believer, you're a saint, you're set apart for God. You're not holy, you're not perfect, but you're being sanctified. But when you get to heaven, the work is done. This is important. When you see the worship, and you'll know what I mean in a second, it's, it's incredible. So the saints simply meet holy ones, set apart ones. They're not elite, they're not exceptional Christians. As a pastor, I'm just like you. Learning to walk out my faith. Anyone doing that too? Every one of us are learning to walk out our faith in fear and trembling. But that's something that's lacking, that, that we're in the presence of God. That we're on holy ground wherever we go because he is there. And we lack that anymore. Well, notice it's the song of the redeemed, that the church, the bride, verse 9 and 13, it's going to talk about this. It's a new song, song in heaven. It's about Christ. It's inspired by his redemptive work. They're looking, and by the way, this is the church. For shedding of the blood on the cross. Look at verse 9, and they sang this new song. Worthy you to take the book and break the seals, for you were slain. They were remembering. Just as we took communion, we're remembering what he was doing. But I think our remembrance there will be different because we will be more mature than we are today. And they focus upon really this redemptive quality of them because you were slain. Again, purchased for God with your own blood. We were purchased for him. We'll understand that, that sacrifice. And notice this, from every tribe, tongue, people and nation that means every nation this is speaking of gentiles it's not speaking about the jewish people the, the tribulation is about to, to start or it started we're just not that part of it right now uh, again what it is is focusing on that tribulation is really about israel waking up that nation of israel shaking up the heathen for the last moment it goes on in verse 10 and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our god and will reign upon the earth you are a kingdom and priest. It's what he's doing in your life. Now, in the Old Testament, you go back to Leviticus. 
you know, a, a priest, he was just, again, he was just a priest but not a king. You're, you're going to be a priest and king. Don't ask me to explain that. I don't know until we get to heaven. But the scripture is making it very clear. He's made you a king and a priest. The praise is unlike anything. Unlike anything in this world. Any worship in this world. It, this, this praise and worship is the most pure. It's sweet. It's fragrant for the heart. There's no pretense, no make-believe. You're not going to be there, well, I'm really angry. Got to praise God. Maybe I'll feel better. No, it, it is all spontaneous. It, it, there's nothing hindering you. Nothing being held back for the first time. Everything is in perfect harmony and unity. Together they're one, praising him and lifting up his name. All because he's the lamb and he's redeemed us. There's one more thing I want to call your attention to. It's Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, I feel pressured when we got to go and, and do this great commission. Well, let me tell you, God will get it done whether you do it or not. You know what? Here, it is done. Because they're from every tribe, every place in this earth. They're all together. They're, they're going to see them all saved. All those saved saints. And they're all praising. They're all, all worshiping. So God will finish this time. Without exception, every redeemed heart in heaven, every redeemed tongue will sing to God in perfect harmony and perfect tune. Unprecedented in history, isn't it? You've been at a worship service, I know, sometime in something being pulled, you know, the, the enemy's pulling you and distracting you, but you will have your focus for the first time complete in every way. I, I love that thought. Be focused upon him. We have the believers, as I mentioned, will be kings and priests. Let's move to verse 11 through 14, and we'll move quickly through here. It's a, a sevenfold doxology through the end of this, and um, it's the final set of verses. There's two groups. First, the, the angels. Then I looked and I heard a voice of notice many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number was myriad and myriads and thousands and thousands. Don't think you can even count. They're innumerable. And yet I've heard people, well, I wonder how many that is. I'm just looking to be there, aren't you? That's it, to see it, to, to experience it. But then it goes on in verse 12, the saying with a loud voice. Oh, stop there for a second. Go back to verse 11, the voice of many angels. Then again in verse 12, loud voice. Notice they're not singing. Nowhere in the Bible, in a word-for-word -word translation, do you ever hear angels singing? I know there's hark to herald angels, but it doesn't say in the Bible. You don't have to sing to praise God. Maybe when we get there, they'll sing. But it's saying they're just speaking it. They're just saying it. And notice what they say. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. They've been wanting to look in all of this time in the church and look at why is he going to die for this person here? Why is he going to die for Ron? Why is they don't get it. And now they get it. And now they're praising him. Because worthy is a lamb who is slain to receive this power, his riches, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. They're just exalting him. And I think if, they're, if they were standing, they would have a hard time standing. And if they were laying, prostrating, they would just kind of melt in. They're in just such awe of God. I know you had those moments of awe of God, but in this world, it's hard to stay in that place and remain in that place. But here, when you get to heaven, you will see it. Well, again, in verses 13, 14, notice who is now praising. In verse 13, it says, Every created thing which is in heaven and on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and all, all things in them. Say, everything. This is the end result. Again, he says, every created thing which is in heaven 
on earth, under the earth, under the sea, all of them, I heard them, notice, saying, to him who sits up on the throne, to the Lamb. They're acknowledging, unless you acknowledge the Lamb in this life, it's too late when you get to that next life. These are ones that have come to know who the Lamb of God is and what he's done. And their response is, to the Lamb, be blessing, honor, and glory, and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen, amen. It's the awe. Used to have a guy come in and says, you can't repeat a song. You can't repeat it that many times, that part of that song. It's not going to be like they did in the Old Testament with the pagans, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, all day long. But they'll be in such awe. Won't you be in awe when you're in the presence of God in heaven? Sometimes it's just not the words to express. How glorious, how wonderful he is. So these living creatures kept on saying amen, and the elders fell down, and they worshiped. Are you ready? I'm ready. The best is truly yet to come. But next week, we're going to see the worst is yet to come. And my prayer is that will motivate us to keep praying, keep trusting, and speak to the word to those that do not know him. The days are short. Father, thank you for today, the time in the scripture. Lord, it's our desire really to honor you, to see you honor. We, we long for that day to be in heaven, to, to worship you and praise you and to, to glorify your name. Lord, we, we long for that. We want that. We want to see it, but we want others to know it. We want those that, that do not know you today to come to that saving knowledge of God. And we ask, God, open up their hearts. Put us right, right there to share with them. Take the words that we've already spoken and open up their hearts by your Holy Spirit. God, we want to take many into the kingdom with us. And we thank you simply for who you are and that you've called us and set us apart. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God have led me through the fire and darkest nights you are close like no other I know you as a father I know you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness.
goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good In every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of your goodness, O oh God. God, you've been so good to us, and we thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself to us, being that kinsman redeemer. Father, we pray that you would bring a revival, a harvest of souls before that time comes. As things become darker and darker, I pray that you'd unite us and make us one. Not just Calvary, all the churches, Lord, that we would go back to the main thing. It's about you, Lord. It's about exalting you, telling the good news of who you are and what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, this morning, I don't know what happened. The internet uh, is... It's just skipping. If someone mentions they tried to watch online and there's something wrong, I'll go ahead and back it up and I'll take a recorded copy and I'll upload it later so they can see the message if they want later. But God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Take care.